Sorry about that, guys. You need the build-up for that. Okay, well, good morning, church. <laughs> it's a good day to be in the house, Lord. Amen. Sorry for the technical difficulties, uh, uh, but today is the second Sunday of one of the most meaningful seasons that we celebrate here in the church. It's the season of Lent. Uh, basically, what that means is that Easter is right around the corner, and this is our opportunity to be just a little bit more intentional about our spiritual reflection and devotion as we prepare to celebrate the day of resurrection. See, as God's people, we don't celebrate Easter the same way the world does. It's not about fluffy bunnies or colored Easter eggs, but for us, it's all about Jesus. And so this is a wonderful time for us to revisit the stories of Jesus and his interactions with people as he taught about the kingdom and prepared himself for the cross. So today we're continuing our message uh, series that we are calling The Last Words of Christ. And I want to start by jumping into the word. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22, scripture says this. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him. He fell on his knees before Jesus. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God. You know what the commandments say. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not be a false witness, do not cheat, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he said, I have obeyed all those commandments since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. You are missing one thing, he said. Go and sell everything you have. Give the money to those who are poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. The man's face fell, and he went away sad because he was very rich. So fast forward from this disheartening encounter with the man known as the rich young ruler to the scene described in Luke 23 as Jesus hung on the cross next to two thieves. Scripture says this, Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what, we des what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so it's likely that the man known as the rich young ruler was in Jerusalem for the Passover on the same weekend that Jesus ended up on the cross. We have no real record of his presence on that weekend to be certain. However, this man was Jewish and all Jews in that day were expected to return to Jerusalem to be a part of the annual Passover celebration. So let's imagine for a few minutes how he might have felt if he had been there to hear the second magnificent word that Jesus spoke from the cross that day, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now let's roll that video. Oh yeah. No, I heard what he said. I heard all too well what Jesus told that man, that, that thief that he was hanging next to. And you know what? It was drastically different than what he told me. You see, the day that I encountered Jesus, I dropped to my knees right in front of him. He had my respect from the start. You see, I wasn't looking for a handout, okay? I explained to him that I had done the hard work. I just needed to know, was there something that I was missing? Was there, was there some good thing that I needed to do in order to inherit eternal life? And you know, sell all that you own. That's what Jesus told me. 
sell it all, and you'll have treasure in heaven. <laughs> yeah, right. You see, I was always taught that salvation is a reward for a life that is filled with good works. It is not a handout that you give to people that can't muster up, up that can't muster up enough character to earn it themselves. My wealth is a clear indication of the favor that rests upon me from God. I had asked about eternal life, and this, this disgusting shell of a man, he's the one that gets it? Jesus told him the day he died, he would be in paradise. This man couldn't bleed a drop of goodness that he hadn't borrowed. No, no, that he hadn't stolen from the righteous man that he's hanging next to. He was a thief, and I'm the one that is treated like I've been robbing God all along. I offered to do what I needed to do. This man offered nothing. All he could do was ask for mercy, and, and that's how he got salvation. That's how he got eternal life. It was just, it was just given to him. Like, like it was a, a gift. Interesting. It's not a perspective that we think of very often. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. When we consider those words, one thing comes to my mind, and it is the world's oldest profession, gardening. See, in the beginning when God created the world, he created a place that includes trees, flowers, green grass, shrubs, animals, birds, rivers, ponds, and lakes. The perfect place was called the Garden of Eden. God then created Adam and Eve and assigned them with a responsibility. They were to take care of the garden. So the oldest profession on earth is gardening, yes? So what does today you will be with me in paradise have to do with gardening? Well, not only was the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve shared their responsibility to take care of the garden, but also it was the place where they enjoyed their relationship with the creator of the garden. See, God hung out in the garden with Adam and Eve and enjoyed sweet fellowship with the prize of his creation. You see, since the beginning of time, you have been meant to experience life with the ones you love most. That's the way God originally set it up from in the beginning. He created the heavens and the earth and humans to be with him and with each other in the garden. You see, God created you and me to experience the garden life with him. You were made for the garden life with God. Think about that for a minute. Well, so what does the garden life have to do with the second word that Jesus spoke from the cross Hang on, I'll show you. We're getting there. However, let's first take a, a look at a couple of other things together on our way back to the garden life. Let's revisit the conversation on the cross. The, the thief says, Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus is talking to a thief. Now, it's interesting to observe that the first words of the cross uh, from Christ were addressed not to us, but to his heavenly Father, right? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And now, Jesus has addressed the Father. His second word is not to his followers, but rather to a thief. So this person that Jesus is talking to on the other cross, some scholars have even gone so far as to translate and describe this thief as a terrorist, and so why do some consider this person a, a terrorist? Uh, well, it's pretty strong language, isn't it? 
It's because the word that's used in the text to identify the thief on the cross in the original language, language is the word kakorgos. And it can be translated as one who is, in an e- who is an evil working person, a violent person, or one working for destruction and evil ways. So we're not talking about the guy who takes a couple hundred bucks from a woman's purse when she isn't looking. We're talking about a violent criminal who is described literally as a worker of evil, a terrorist. So think about that with me for a minute. What's the makeup of a terrorist? Well, it's someone who murders innocent people and lives a life that is an uprising against a nation of different ideals in ways that bring about death and destruction, thinking that by doing so, they will attain a fast track to paradise. So some scholars say that this pretty much describes the guys next to Jesus hanging on their crosses together. And the reason that Jesus is having a conversation with this terrorist, well, he was the one that was close by during Jesus' darkest hour. So William William Willimon describes it so well when he says this, that we, God's people, we keep getting tripped up with Jesus' reach, particularly when its scope is beyond the bounds of the inner circle of the church us. He says, let's be truthful now. Few of us, his disciples, was close enough for him to address. See, we had made it very lonely up there for Jesus on top of Calvary. Humiliated, naked, reviled by the world in the most public and degrading of tortures. And Jesus had to talk to whoever was close at hand. His ministry, his sermons, his actions had now cast him among the very worst people in the middle of the commonest of criminals. Family, friends, and disciples were mostly nowhere to be found when the going got rough and the beating began. Jesus was alone. There was no one there to comfort him in his need. Peter, the rock, had disappeared. There was nobody to talk to but a terrorist. Lord, we will stand by you. They all said that at the last supper dinner table on that last night. But that was in the quiet and comfort of family. And in many ways, the church family were great about professing and lifting up Jesus inside the walls of the church. However, how are we doing out there in the world? Are we lifting up Jesus as we go about our everyday walking around lives in our community, our neighborhoods, our businesses, and our schools? Out there with an angry mob and the Romans taking action, we say nothing. And Jesus hangs there alone with two terrorists. Well, do you remember what Jesus said about two people? He said, I tell you the truth, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So have you ever thought about Calvary being one of the first places that church ever broke out? You see, all three were there under the name of Jesus, King of the Jews. They all gathered there on that hill under his name. And to his dying day, Jesus was true in his own words. Where two are gathered in my name, I am with you. The second word that Jesus speaks from the cross to the terrorist that echoes down to us is a relevant and personal word because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his or her own way. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. It could have and would have and should have been us on that cross next to Jesus. But the word Jesus speaks that the terrorist heard and that we need to hear is this. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me. See, sometimes when we're hanging in pain and experiencing the darkest, most difficult days of our life that we could never have imagined we would be suffering through, 
We need to hold fast to the reality of the nature and character of Jesus. That he is the God who is with us today. So when you are on the edge of foreclosure, Jesus is with you. When you're bearing the difficulty of marriage, Jesus is with you. When you're suffering through the terrible twos and potty training your kids is just about to kill you, Jesus is with you. When your teenager hits puberty and their voice changes and their hormones kick into high gear and you wonder, who is this kid that won't say a word to you but expects you to finance their lives? Well, then Jesus is with you. Teenagers, when your mom and dad jump headfirst into a midlife crisis, you are not alone. Even if they leave you in the, in, in the wake because they can't handle the responsibility, still you are not alone. It's not your fault that you're getting drilled in the heart and home isn't like it was when you were five years old. Please remember, Jesus is with you. Grandmas and grandpas, when you wonder if your kids and grandkids even care about anything or anyone other than themselves, and you can't understand why they do what they do. Like, why don't they pay cash for anything except instead of racking up all this debt that's going to that's gonna wreck their lives? Well, grandmas and grandpas, remember then, Jesus is with you and with them. And on the cross, Jesus is with the terrorist thief. He says the words many terrorists long to hear uh, because that's often why uh, he or she did what they did in the first place. Even if it was radically wicked and evil motives, many terrorists, they, that's what they have, hopes of being in paradise at the end of their heinous crime against humanity. And the difference between every other terrorist and this one next to Jesus on the cross is that this one turned to Jesus. And when he turned to Jesus, and when you and I turn to Jesus and repent of our sin and confess our sin and walk into the forgiveness that Jesus offers to all who turn to him, the result not only is that Jesus is with us today, but that we will be with Jesus in paradise. And so that word paradise, it's an interesting word. It is the word paradisos in the original language. It was a word used to talk about, to describe, uh, to refer to the gardens of kings. And so the terrorist said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And so the thief was talking to Jesus about a kingdom. And the kingdom is all about a king. And just to make sure everybody understood the truth about Jesus, God allowed Pilate to have a sign uh, marked and written out that declared who Jesus was, right? The king of the Jews. The king. A kingdom was about a king. Our king has a garden. And when Jesus said, today you will be, you will be with me in paradisos, in paradise, the first century Jewish mind would have known exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about the garden of the king. The garden with the king. Jesus was telling the terrorist, "Today you will be living in the gar- you will be living the garden life with me." Well, remember you were made for the garden life. The word Jesus uses for paradise here is the same word that's used in the Septuagint, which is a Greek version of the Hebrew Old Testament. And so paradisos is the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, to describe Eden, the garden of Eden, the paradisos of Eden, the paradise of Eden, the garden of the king and creator of the world and everything in it. Let's look at that verse in Genesis. It says this, And the Lord God planted the garden of Eden, in the east, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of the garden to water the garden, flowed out of Eden to water the garden. 
So this terrorist was invited by Jesus to go back to Eden, back to the way it was before the fall, back to the garden life with God, with Jesus, with the king, back to the garden of the king. And from Genesis through Revelation, Jesus is talk about, talking about living the, the garden life with him, getting back to the garden life with him. He talks throughout uh, the scriptures about paradise, where we are with him. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, Jesus says this, Whoever has ears should listen to what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. Here is what I will do for anyone who has victory over sin. I will let that person eat from the tree of life in God's paradise. Paradisos. So the second magnificent word from the cross, it means this. It means that today you can begin to live the garden life with God, regardless of what kind of sin you have done, what kinds of stuff that you've been involved with, what kind of past you may have, because until we turn to Jesus, we are all just a bunch of terrorists in need of forgiveness, in need of a fresh start with God that allows us to live the garden life with him. See, you and I, we're made for the garden life with God. Well, so what is the garden life with God? Well, it's the way that God dreamed all this up in the beginning before sin entered the picture and fractured our relationships. God intended it to be this way with, with all people that we were intended to do life with in the garden. And so it's about our relationship with God and it's about our relationship with others. Living the garden life with God is the whole theme that runs throughout the entire Bible. And so it's about us getting back to garden living. It's about being in a healed, whole, right relationship with God and being in a healed, whole, right relationship with each other. The garden life is about loving God and loving others. And so can you imagine what it would look like if you were experiencing life where you were right on target with God and right on target with your relationship with your spouse, your family, your boss, your neighbors? If you can imagine that, that's a glimpse of the garden life. And that is part of why Jesus died on the cross, to make a way for us to get back to the garden life with God, where sin just no longer messed it up. And so the rich young ruler, he missed it, and he was sad and frustrated. And the terrorist thief next to Jesus got it and enjoyed the garden life with Jesus the king in his garden later that day and throughout eternity. So church, may we not miss what God has in mind for all of us who are his creation since the time of creation. May we always make our way back to garden living as we respond to Jesus and to his magnificent words. Yes? Yea and amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for this day, for the opportunity that you've given us to come around your word, to come into this fellowship of believers, to do life together, to live a piece of that garden life with others, the opportunity that you give us to live the garden life with you. God, if we were to be honest, we'd have to admit that so often we are the ones that get in our own way and prevent ourselves from living the garden life. So often we get tripped up in our own minds, our own hearts, our own uh, uh, intentions, our own ideas about the way we think things should be. Sometimes, quite frankly, we just get stuck in our own heads. We think we uh, know what you want, but we don't ask you what you want. We think we know who you are, but we don't uh, dig deeper in relationship with you to find out truly who you are. We think we know things because, well, knowledge is everywhere. But the reality is, what we so often don't know is that deep, true garden relationship with you. God, I pray that you would just speak to each and every one of our hearts today. 
that you would help us to um, just deal with the reality in our hearts. Lord, when I, when I saw uh, that rich young ruler video, when I thought about what he was saying, God, I admit, I thought he was justified in some of that. I admit that I never looked at it from uh, the perspective of your love and your grace and your mercy. I felt his frustration. But he missed the reality of who you are. God, we don't want to miss the reality of who you are. Help us to, uh, to peel off the layers of the things that we think and show us the light of the things that you know, that we might know you more and more every day. God, I pray that you would just um, fan the, the, the flame of desire for us to know you that way, that we might dig deeper, that we might know you more, that we might um, just push aside things that are not of you, and that we might spend time in your presence, in relationship, living this life today with you. God, we thank you and we praise you for all that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know the Lord is speaking to you today, but your invitation is to identify what next steps he might be calling you to take. Maybe it's a conversation, maybe it's information, maybe um, it's something that he's been speaking to you for a while, and today's the day that you stop pushing back against it and you say yes to it. Whatever it is that uh, God has uh, put upon your heart as your next steps in your faith journey. We'd invite you to connect with us if we can be of some assistance to you. We'd be honored to walk with you, to pray with you, to do life with you as together we grow further and further in our faith.